Hey, uh, thanks everyone for attending the talk. Uh, this, I know this is the last talk of the day, but thanks for your patience. Um, uh, we are going to talk about uh, standardizing the generation of uh, images and signing of the boot images with uh, U-boot kind of as an example. Uh, let's quickly jump to it um, with, um, I'm Vignesh. I'm working for Texas Instruments for the past 10 years, uh, working mostly on uh, Linux K3 generation of uh, SOCs, uh, supporting Linux and U-Boot. Um, um, uh, this is Neha. Oh, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Neha, and I'm also working in Texas Instruments for the past two years, and I mainly work on U-Boot development. Yeah. So um, we also have Simon Glass was not attending the event, but, you know, we work closely with Simon in, in terms of, you know, getting the uh, boot images for the slightly weird K3 architecture to be uh, an upstream in a uh, consistent way. So, uh, well, so uh, just talking about the motivation for the talk, um, you know, bootloaders of modern SOCs have uh, do a lot more than just, you know, initializing the DDR and loading the kernel, right? So uh, there are multiple platform level firmwares and, you know, require quite a bit of complex uh, packaging and signing procedures and you know uh, uh, U-Boot has solved this in different ways over the years and you know this is one of the uh, standardization efforts that U-Boot went through and how you could kind of leverage this across the SOC ecosystems right so uh, we'll, we'll provide a quick overview of uh, U-Boot and the firmware packing uh, problems and, uh, and with an example of a you know boot flow of a complex SOC and how uh, uh, we can leverage the binman tool and U boot in terms of uh, firmware packing and extending the bind and how we extended the binman to support a DIK3 class of SOC and uh, and the future developments around it. Okay, so let's get started. I guess most most of you may have already worked on U-Boot here, so it's, it's, it's uh, just an FII that it, U-Boot is universal bootloader. It has a rich set of peripheral stack and it's very flexible. Um, it's kind of tightly integrated to boot uh, kernel, uh, Linux kernel, uh, and you know it supports multiple architectures, ARM um, x86, the RIX-5 recent ones, and uh, there is device-free based uh, hardware description support and, you know, any other means of uh, describing the hardware and, yeah, so it's one of the most versatile bootloaders available. Um, so let's start with the problem uh, at hand, right? So um, long ago, if you were working with an MCU kind of a device, it's mostly a U-boot that is a bootloader that you would have and just flash it into the um, uh, the flash memory storage that's there and uh, build the image with make, flash it onto the flash storage and you're done and basically some amount of environment to do the selections, right? So, it's, um, and moving on, if you were to look at the uh, a very simple uh, microprocessor class of SOCs, we will at least have uh, something called as uh, uh, U boot kind of provides you something called a secondary program loader, which would be a, a first set of program that gets loaded, which you know would do the DDR initialization and load the full set of U boot uh, uh, bootloader with command line interface and whatnot that allows you to load a kernel from different storage medias, right? So. Uh, there's also a pro uh, support for something called tertiary program loader, which could be a precursor to SPL and it would open up a larger memory within the SOC or help us choose between different boot medias uh, where the SPL is located and kind of initialize that. So um, now, as you can see, there are multiple uh, components that are getting added up here. So. Uh, a trivial way is to just cat them and create a big Im big image and go and flash it into the storage media. But, you know, there is always a need for metadata to be there along with these images, which is at what, set, what offset would you flash them at? How would you, you know, uh, pad them, align them and whatnot. So, uh, and of course, there may be additional firmware that we'll talk about, uh, which makes the image to keep growing and growing with different components. Now let's look at an example of you know modern systems, right? Uh, starting with let's say x86, right? So 
even there you have uh, you know an SPL here uh, U boot but there are a bunch of vendor specific um, you know microcode related firmwares and whatnot so all this would need to be packed in a certain way flushed at certain offsets in a certain manner and all this essentially requires uh, some amount of intelligent packaging tools right so if you were to look at arm 64 example so uh, a typical SOC would you know maybe start off an SPL and this is an example or a you know uh, just an example it need not be exactly same but uh, a typical SOC would start off ROM, uh, ROM would start off an SPL, and there is something called as a secure firmware at EL3 level, another one in a secure SEL and one, S, uh, EL1 level, uh, and you know, then the U-boot that is running has a non-secure uh, firmware, and, and which then boots up to Linux, right? So, uh, and if you were to look at the load sequence, uh, this is probably the example how the control would flow, but if you were to look at the sequence of how the image would load, uh, you probably don't want to duplicate the boot media drivers at multiple uh, software components, or probably use SPL with one uh, image that can load multiple, I mean, SPL would load all the images, like the EL3 firmware, the EL1 level firmware, uh, the U-boot at the non-secure EL1 level, and so on, so, right, so. Um, Let's look at uh, what we call as an heterogeneous SOC, which would have more than just an application Cortex-A core, right? So maybe multiple real-time cores and um, you know whatnot, right? So in in such a case, you know it it's now uh, even more. Uh, there probably is a ROM running on one of the MCU cores that would start off an SPL, and then SPL is responsible for loading multiple of uh, such firmwares, right? Uh, the examples that we saw on the previous slide, additional to that, there may be an AUTOS running on the MCU core. Uh, this uh, power management firmware that would run on a power management or a dedicated core that's meant for power management. And you know, uh, ROM may additionally load a security management firmware or it, it may again be an SPL that is doing it. Right, so yeah. So we'll take a subset of the problem and try to see how, how the image would look like or what, what it entails, right? So if you were to just look at what is required for an ARM64 system to kind of boot up and run, right? So you have the EL3 level firmware and the secure firmware and the management uh, power management firmware and you know something that will run on the non-secure EL1 side, which eventually will take you to Linux. Um, so. Yeah, so we'll just take a subset of this and try to look how the image uh, for such uh, such an image would then be needed to be loaded by uh, SPL stage. Okay. So, uh, so this is something similar what we have on our uh, K3 generation of devices, where the first core or the primary boot core is a MCU core, which is an R5 core, uh, and then. The R5 core runs an SPL image, which would then start off the application core or the big A, A cores, A72, A53, and so on, right? So, um, so there may be multiple MPU cores and a single MPU core on the same die, and we need to basically start off all of them. So, this kind of diagram shows the you know the boot flow sequence. So, the ROM would start off an SPL on the R5 core, which is kind of in a different color here, and uh, this SPL is responsible for loading the rest of the uh, system images. Um, so let's look at the image itself, right? So as I said, uh, the, the TFA or the trusted firmware ARM is the image at EL3 level. There will be an optional opti add uh, secure ELN, EL1, you know, the secure OS. Uh, and there is a device management firmware, uh, which we call DM in the TI context, but it's essentially the system control core processor that ARM defines, right? So um, all this essentially uh, combined with the SPL that would run on the application core and the device free uh, make up uh, a binary that, that would be required to get the A core started up, right? So I think the easiest way that you would start packing this up is something called as flattened U image free. If you have worked with U boot, you could be familiar with this, which essentially is you know a device tree like description language for images you would describe images using 
uh, a device three like syntax, and there's a tool called MK Image in, in within the U boot, which will help you to essentially take this and pack pack them up with, with you know uh, uh, basic uh, offsets and alignments and so on, uh, right? So, so taking the problem a bit further, what we also need to do is had security on authenticated boot on top of it which essentially means that each of the components here would need to have a, a certificate that is you know, signed by both SOC vendor and maybe contest signed by the end user as well, right? So with an optional uh, encryption requirement as well, and you would be signing using some sort of publicly, publicly uh, cryptographic methods such as RSA or ECDSA. So, so as you can see, you know, it's, it's probably that the entire image is signed with a single certificate or each of the component may be signed with their own individual certificates you know re requiring uh, additional data that is provided for each of the components right so right so uh, and again uh, it's not just a matter of packing you'll also have to sign and and provide ability for customers to use those scripts and sign their own, on their own as well Right, so so this 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 container on the right essentially is what we call in our TI uh, boot flow uh, TI SPL dot bin, but it's essentially a, a combination of these images uh, that get started on application core. Okay, so how did we uh, have it? Like maybe uh, up to a year ago, when you had uh, we were essentially having a bunch of custom scripts which. Uh, pack the images using the make file and the MK image tool that's available when you boot. So take all this inputs and feed it into U boot uh, repository ha has, you know, command line arguments to the make file and you basically, the U boot build system would uh, give out tispl.bin with all this included. Uh, but then there was a separate set of scripts that uh, TI used to maintain. Uh, over uh, at a different Git repository called CoSecDev K3, with which you know vendor-specific custom scripts used to be. Uh, it's it's basically a vendor-specific scripts which will help you to sign each of these components and create the final image, right? So, as you can see, it's kind of has its own sets of issues. First of all, it's it's um, it's kind of is not scalable because each end user may be coming from a different background and they need to learn vendor specific signing scripts, which is itself in a, a painful process. Uh, it's kind of not distro built friendly, wherein we are now forcing the distro uh, creators to pull in certain SOC specific scripts just to create those images out. Uh, and you know, and within the boot itself, there are variations in terms of whether or not you want to start and load an MCU core or not, or whether the device is, uh, non follows a non-secure boot flow versus a fully secure boot flow or the high secure device flow, or you know whether the end user has, you know, this, all this complexities to be handled within scripts and means that you, know, you need to understand the scripts in and out to do any changes that you want to do. Of course, all this did not have any unit level testings, which which meant that it's it's very easy to you know, have it broken. So this kind of is a snapshot of how the script kind of looked, and I'm not going to go into details, but it essentially shows you that you know it's pretty much not straightforward to read it intuitively and understand what what it's doing, right? So, um, well, I'll hand over to Neha to show how we went through this and actually solved the. Uh, problem using the bin man flow. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. So uh, whatever Vignesh has described up to now is a subset of the number of challenges that we see when we actually pack firmware. For example, in embedded systems, you'll need to make sure alignment is proper. You need to make sure that during your build, the dependencies that you need that finally get stitched up into your final bootloader binary have to be present before you um, actually go and pack it. At the same time, there is also a need for runtime discovery of content, uh, stuff such as compression. Compression is very important in uh, when it comes to packing 
uh, bootloader binaries. Formats, standard formats such as FIT, uh, CBFS, FIP, all of these are again just, just headers that you have prepended on top of your bootloader binaries. These are these are problems that are solved individually by SOC specific um, tools with SOC specific scripts. And whether or not you'll be actual, you'll actually be able to examine an image finally. All of these are challenges that uh, you come across when you, um, uh, when you pack bootloader binaries. So Simon Glass had initially developed a tool called Binman to solve these issues. So the same way that we describe hardware in the form of device tree, you can actually reimagine the bootloader image as described data. So at the front end, what you'll have is a device tree with, which actually describes what goes into your final binary. And you have a Python backend, which is the binman tool. And this is right now loosely coupled with the U-Boot project, but um, it is possible theoretically to move it out and use it as a standalone tool. So an example you can see down here. So what we've done is just packed a U-Boot SPL binary and a U-Boot binary with padding in between. And we've explicitly set the offset of the U-Boot binary to 8,000. So it's, it's visually, you can see clearly what's exactly going into your final binary. And that is the beauty of um, the binman tool. So when does this binman tool run? As part of the U-Boot build system, it runs once all of the inputs that are needed for um, that are needed for the final boot image. Once they're all built, Binman runs. And it can also be run later. For example, you have a signing server that you want to uh, sign with different keys later on. You can even uh, run Binman later on. And it's a standalone CLI utility, which you can again uh, run at any time. So the crux of Binman, how it was built was is entirely based on entries. So each uh, image actually consists of entries. Entries are nothing but data. So each entry, as you can see, like the U-boot SPL entry and the U-boot entry, they're just blobs of binary data. And you have the capacity to add properties to these uh, entries to further manipulate the way um, you want to change up your final image. Entries will be packed one after the other, unless, for example, you specify a explicit offset in which case it will you know uh, get packed at that offset and entries are hierarchical so you can have a big section entry which consists of multiple child entries and bidman is smart enough to work its way uh, from inside out so this is what it looks like uh, you have the base entry class and a few of the properties like for example what offset the entry is supposed to be at if it's aligned or not uh, the size of the entry, again, it's optional, and whether or not it's part of a larger section. So all of these are properties that go into your base entry class, from which you derive the entry blob class, which is, again, nothing but a binary blob. And this is the most commonly used uh, entry, at least in Binman right now. See, for example, we have image-specific classes that have been derived from this blob entry, uh, like U-boot SPL and U-boot image. Again, these are standard U-boot images, so uh, these are already existing. But to solve our problem at hand, we need to extend this to fit our use case. So how do you do that? It's very easy to add an entry in Binman. So all you need to do is just add a Python file with the extended entry class in the Binman entry type directory, and Binman will be able to find it if it's uh, invoked in your device tree. So you can even have tools that run within your um, entry class. So all of the magic of you know, signing and alignment and all of that can be abstracted out into this entry class. And the main logic is in control.py, which um, most chances are that you will not need to touch it right now. It's just that's where the whole packing goes in and it figures out what to build and when. So you can look at other uh, entries for examples on how to uh, add your own entry type. And the, again, another um, great aspect of Binman is that it has 100% code coverage. So if you add an entry, you have to add a test to make sure that it's covered. 
So this is what it looks like after we uh, migrated to using Binman. So as you can see, there are no external repositories. Um, there are no uh, long shell scripts that actually go and do the common MK image stuff that you see. So all you have to do is give the inputs to uh, U-Boot using Binman and the uh, Binman device tree specifying the way you want your image to be and it will uh, generate out the required tispl.bin. So this is what it finally looked like. So this is a snippet of the device tree that we used. So the complex tispl binary that Vignesh had mentioned before has been uh, put into a very simple visual device tree format. So here you can see you have a TFA uh, binary blob, which uh, in our case needed to be signed by an X509 certificate on the top. So that is your TI secure entry type on the top, which has properties like content pointing to what it has to actually go ahead and sign and the key file with which it has to sign the image. And then you have again an opti um, uh, binary below it again doing the same thing, uh, going ahead and signing the opti image. And since DM is not a standard image, what we did is uh, we made it a DM blob ext, which is an external blob entry. So external blob entries are very useful because you can just go ahead and grab external binaries that you um, provide in the build. So it will just go and search for tidm.bin and once, in fi once it finds it, it will just go and pack it in the uh, final image. And yeah, so this is just the continuation. So you have the A72 SPL binary. Again, um, it's the same thing that's being done. Uh, U-boot SPL node DTB is again a cust uh, is a standard entry type. So you've, we've already uh, have support in the uh, binman directory for uh, an SPL binary. Similarly, we have support for the device tree binary, which is packed at the end. So a few things to note here, which show how uh, flexible this tool is. Again, what I've mentioned before, custom entry types such as TI Secure, uh, you can extend it to fit your use case. Uh, Binman is also able to evaluate config options. So for example, you need to use the same Binman device tree across boards, uh, they probably have this, which probably have the same SOC. You can do that by making use of kconfig and uh, standard entry types. So Binman has been actively uh, been worked on by the community. So you have support for numerous standard entry types, which make porting to using Binman very simple. So putting out that slide once again, just to give a contrast of how it was versus how it is now. So yeah, it's, it is in a much better shape. So again, a little sneak peek into the TI secure entry uh, Python class. I'll just go through this really quick. So uh, apart from the special init method, you have the read node method. So the read node method is what goes and grabs all of the properties from your device tree. So it uses FDT tools to go and get those uh, extra properties that you've probably defined again to fit your, fit your use case. And uh, you can use that later on in your um, in your entry. Now the meat of this whole uh, binman entry is the obtain contents uh, method, which actually goes and does whatever magic you've abstracted out. Uh, in our case, the get certificate is what goes and uses OpenSSL to generate that X509 certificate. So all of that has been abstracted out here. And obtain contents sets the contents of that entry to whatever you want it to be. The Another important method would be the process contents. Say your blob includes symbols that have changed during build. Uh, process contents runs again for every entry at the end of binman, uh, end of the binman uh, build, so that it goes and updates the data binary to fit those new symbols in. And another method is the add bin tools method. So bin tools is, a, is just a special way of saying uh, that you can use other executables in the bitman flow. 
And this really shows the, again, the flexibility of Binman. So for example, in our case, OpenSSL was a tool that earlier shell scripts just invoked. But now, since it's a bin tool, which again goes and does the same thing, but you know, you've abstracted that out. So we go and use that OpenSSL tool and that is a bin tool already. So this shows how you can also extend to add bin tools. If, if your um, board currently you know, generates boot binaries by running some scripts, chances are it's very easy to port them with the use of bin tools. So numerous advantages to using Binman. One is, again, it's data driven. So it's very visually appealing to read and understand. And what happens is that this, this uh, helps familiarity across the SOC vendors who will be using um, Binman commonly. And again, more and more platforms are being migrated to Binman. So uh, a new SOC developer will be able to ramp up much faster and uh, will be able to port a new SOC uh, much quicker than before. Also, it's object-oriented design. So you've abstracted much of the heavy uh, labor out of the um, what it used to be, and it's all it's all abstracted out. So that's another benefit. And there are functionalities that haven't been covered here, but are great. Like for example, templating and fit generators. These all help in code reuse. So um, considering your, uh, again, your SOC will have numerous boards that it supports, you can reuse your uh, binman code across all of them. And uh, runtime detection of symbols uh, is again a, a really great thing. So in our case, we use a fit header to uh, actually go and find the offsets. But in case you need symbols to figure out where you want to jump to at the end, uh, binman does that add symbols according to the image position. So that's also a, a great way of um, yeah, building your final image. A few things uh, that we are uh, currently developing, one is the ability to pass firmware uh, via the CLI argument. So currently, all of the uh, file names are hard-coded in the description. So that's something we're trying to uh, get away from. and. Uh, again, many boards are present in the tools directory. Many scripts are used for uh, different, uh, building different images, which all, all of them can be moved to Binman at the end. So that is, again, something that we are working on. And signing within a fit generator currently isn't supported, but that is also in active development. So I'll uh, pause here for Q&A and a few open discussion points that are currently being discussed both um, in person and on the mailing list are listed. So uh, yeah, I think I'll open it for Q&A.